Okay, so um, I, I think the idea of the conversation was was to give some introduction to some of the work that's been done, uh, talk a little bit about what this group, mostly through the Planets Foundation and through SETI, has been trying to do recently with uh, with uh, basically private funding, and um, that that's that's our big push. We have some um, connections through a number of us to the Breakthrough uh, Foundation. And our eventual goal is to be able to uh, demonstrate existence of a bunch of thoughtful people who have um, demonstrated that thoughtful resource in creating probably a white paper or a series of um, series of more technical discussions that justify some of the extravagant claims that, that you're going to hear from some of you for the first time uh, today. Uh, so there's a I, we've got a group of I think there's only about nine or ten slides. Let me run through those real quick, and then let's. I think what we ought to do is just have a, a broad discussion in preparation for. Um, so, we we have this goal of taking the skeleton of a draft paper, incorporating all of your ideas and involvement, and produce a, a document that that's maybe ten to twenty pages that's readable uh, and that has enough technical meat to it to be distributed to folks that could study it and and. Um, uh, provide uh, hopefully some some additional resources through some of the technology development that, that has started and, and needs needs more people and needs people as much as it needs as it needs money at this point. Um, and Jeff, yes, excuse me, Jill. Since you mentioned the breakthrough connection, um, will this first paper uh, imagine in any way, shape, or form the large aperture phased up laser? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, the Breakthrough Foundation is, is now soliciting proposals for um, development efforts related to producing the Beamer uh, for this 100 gigawatt laser that, that's needed to propel um, potato nanochips to um, the Alpha Centauri system. And the Planets Foundation will create a document. It's only four or five pages, and it's not very much money. But but yes, we will be involved in that. And anybody, I was going to mention it at the end of our discussion. Anybody here who wants to contribute, we'd love we'd love to have your involvement. Um, it's an attempt uh, to address a slightly different problem, which is building big optics that can be phased to produce a, a coherent, small, high power spot to propel. Uh, star chips, and we could we could get into that um, later, I guess, if the folks want to. Get well, I it. I didn't mean to derail to derail your conversation. No, no, the it's important that you're talking about will not include any of that. Um, I don't. Uh, it's up to up to the group. My feeling is that there there are um, common technologies to both, and uh, we have certainly begun to argue with Miller and company that that they really have to worry about the telescopes. As you know, Phil Lubin is pushing a very different concept, a bunch of little 20 centimeter apertures. And, um, and I, think, I think that shootout has yet to take in place. And, and if this group wants to get involved in it, I, we, should, we should pursue that. Um, yeah, okay, let's talk about that. Uh, to get started, the, the, the basic idea behind this began a couple of years ago with some funding from a, a different um, wealthy individual uh, and Casey Harlington and, and, and Dynamic Structures were deeply involved in the development of a, of a big telescope concept they called Colossus, which has evolved into something more, more directly suited to M-dwarf exoplanet direct imaging from the ground. Um, the, the key elements of, of this, this uh, consortium were to, to, and it was more engineers than it was scientists, I would say. Um, Mike wasn't in it initially, but, but certainly um, um, the folks at Dynamic Structures that are now building the TMT structure were heavily a part of it. And, then, and the two key, um, I think the two key elements were, maybe there were three, but one of them was to figure out how to break the scaling relations that, that really define how Keck era telescopes are costed and what what um, what's needed is to break and I'll show you what some of those relationships are um, the other is to figure out how to make a telescope which is really scalable and scalable here means um, in some ways it's a synthetic beam so for you interferometry folks it's a it's a 
it's a honest an honest hybrid between uh, an interferometer and, and a telescope system. Um, so some numbers that are useful because we've um, mostly with Svetlana's effort, we've, we've argued that once you get big enough so you can get a 200 to one signal to noise in the photometry of the reflected light off of the exoplanet, you can do some, some pretty interesting um, inversion uh, problems. And so this is just a plot that shows the kind of signal to noise under very optimistic conditions you might uh, you might expect as a function of wavelength and as a function of telescope aperture, and the point is that that in, as you go to the infrared things get better, and as of course as you go to a larger aperture they get better. This is a problem where the detection and, and the, the it's a you call it a, a, a diameter to the fourth problem that our ability to uh, measure at a given signal to noise. Um, the signal off of the exoplanet actually scales faster than the diameter of the telescope to the fourth power. And that's, that's the reason why this is a ground-based problem um, in, the, in, in the case where we can make telescopes that are diffraction limited. Um, and that, that's what this is all about. And here's an example of, of what happens when you imagine a, a, an exoplanet orbiting a, a star and we have enough resolution to separate the light the reflected light of the planet from the star, and we observe over um, over the rotational and the orbital period of the star with a signal to noise of about 200. Um, and what we did was we put a, an Earth-like planet uh, in the position of the exoplanet. We looked at the light curve, and then we inverted it to see what um, see what surface structure could be resolved. And it was really quite surprising that with only a signal to noise of 200, we can resolve continents and oceans. And, and um, of course, at the same time, if you look at wavelength resolved observations, you can begin to see temperature structure. And, and, uh, and uh, if you look at, at the red edge, for example, in, in a plant spectrum, you can see, um, you can see, uh, uh, the Amazon, the Amazon rainforest, and then if you look for sharp edges, you might even see hyperstructures on the on the planet as evidence of advanced life. So we're we're pretty excited about the, this notion that the goal of 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 a of an exoplanet system is to get to a signal to noise that approaches uh, 100. Let's say lots of things can be done at that level, and then and then to dedicate the this this uh, telescope to looking at at um, um, at a few exoplanets. Here's the problem. Um, so those of us that are old enough remember the days when we talked about the overwhelmingly large 100 meter telescope. Millions of dollars went into estimating how much that costs. And, and so the, the graph here shows um, the expected cost of these telescopes versus their aperture. And there's some amazing things on this graph. For example, um, in the cost estimates from Keck up to the OWL uh, scaled with the area of the telescope. Which, if you think about it, is amazingly optimistic, right? That it's just the area of the telescope that, that determines the cost. The cost per um, collecting area is an invariant. And part of the reason for that is these are all Keck era telescopes. In some ways, they're all, except for GMT, but they're, they're, that's even more surprising that it falls on the same curve. That um, you can estimate the cost of the telescope from the, from the moving mass is the other, the other interesting feature here. So the mass of the telescope scales with the area, the collecting area, and then the total cost scales with the moving mass. And this is the problem that we fight if we want to talk about having a, one of the problems we fight if we talk about having a telescope, which, which is um, uh, going to do exoplanet detection. And as you know, the exoplanet detection direct, direct uh, imaging problem really depends on resolution as much as anything. So that's our problem. Um, you could phrase it another way, which is that we, what we really have to do is we have to decrease the moving mass of the telescope. Um, and so with, with the folks at Dynamic Structures over the last few years, several things have, have evolved. One of them is the idea of using a structure which is under tension, um, like a bicycle wheel, to decrease mass. And in the, in the top right is this concept that we've called the exolife finder. And each one of those sub-apertures is, is maybe five meters across. 
Um, each of them is a segment of an off-axis parabola. And what they do is uh, they create a single common image with, uh, with a set of secondary mirrors that in the second image on the right, you can see, you can see where they're collected to form a Gregorian focus. So in some ways you want to think about this telescope as just a, a, a great big parabola that's segmented into, in this case, say 25 five meter segments. Um, the kind of, the, the cool thing about this is that each one of the off-axis parabolas has its own secondary. And the secondary is an elliptical mirror that creates an image and it's a common focus for each one of the sub-apertures. So we know how to build an AO system for each one of the sub-apertures. Um, uh, what, we don't, what we don't usually think about is how we phase them. Uh, because it's on a common mount, we don't have one of the big problems that an interferometer has, which is, which is um, the, uh, the, the phase matching that has to be done when you, when you have long baseline variations. In this case, the, the baseline variations have to do with the relatively floppy structure and with the atmosphere. Uh, and for the sort of 25 meter diameters of this telescope, that means that the path, the path length differences are uh, a few microns. Um, what that means is if you, if we built an AO system for each one of the sub apertures, uh, for example, with an adaptive secondary on each, on each one of them, the kind of image that we would see is the image on the, on the third panel on the right, uh, on the left, uh, we would get a bunch of speckles and each of the speckles has the diffraction limit of the of the uh, the full the full aperture but um, the power would not be in in a, in a single diffraction limit in the limited image so the trick is to figure out from that image um, how to phase each of the sub apertures and this group worked for a little bit to come up with some algorithms that you were are probably not too surprising to many of you, that, that encoded in that image domain is all the phase information you need to go from the left uh, to the right, the diffraction limited image, which is now diffraction limited over the full, the full aperture of the telescope. So rather than build uh, a big telescope of many sub-apertures uh, that are close packed, um, and in that case, you end up with a secondary mirror, which has to service many different sub-apertures. You should build a telescope which is scalable with a bunch of sub-elements, each of which is an off-axis parabola and its own secondary. Each one is a diffraction-limited telescope, and since they come from a common parent optic, uh, the, the final image is constructed by piston and tip tilting each of those each of those images that come from the sub-aperture. So with, with the help of dynamic structures, um, this group went off and, and looked at the cost of, of building telescopes this way. Um, notice there's some disadvantages. One is that this system is, is very optically fast. It has a very short focal length compared to its diameter, which means it's ha it has a small field of view. This is this is a telescope with a few arc seconds field of view. It's not going to be used for looking at, at clusters of galaxies um, or extended objects. It's going to be really dedicated to exoplanets. Um, but the other, the other interesting feature is that the telescope is, rather than build a telescope, which is a fairly rigid, stiff structure, which means it has a lot of mass, build a telescope which is floppy, maybe even more floppy than the atmosphere, and you, and you phase things not by keeping the mirrors rigid, primary mirrors, but by using those independent secondary mirrors. And each of the secondaries is pretty tiny. They're only a few centimeters across. So, so that means that you've, you've, not, you've not created a stiff, heavy structure and then, and then uh, had to deal with the atmosphere. But you started from the outset to build something which was only as stiff as it needed to be. And then you used interferometry ideas to recombine the beams at the final focus. So, so part of all of this story is then how do we make mirrors that are, um, are less massive than the conventional mirrors that, for example, go into a Keck structure. 
And that was that was the last piece of technology in what in what this group did, which was to which was to use. So there, there's a Lyon group um, which has developed a, what they call a tur polymer that has a energy density that's that's maybe a hundred times more and the energy density is larger than current electroactive polymers. And it's possible to now, if we are talking about active time scales rather than adaptive time scales, build mirrors that are basically window glass uh, with a 3D printed structure on the back of them. Um, and then a reaction surface, which is another piece of window glass. The window glass is itself roughly in the shape of an off-axis parabola. And then use the fact that that this is a telescope that will always have a bright star in its field of view, right? This is looking at exoplanets. So we have this this fantastic advantage of always having um, a near point source in the field of view that allows us to uh, correct the wavefront and do the do the piston correction and tip tilt correction of each of the sub apertures, and then occasionally to uh, shape the mirror surfaces. So um, the group is is now working on a on a demonstration of a mirror that is was never polished and it's a piece of window glass and it's it's about ten times less massive per square meter than in conventional mirrors. So the other thing that that happens when oh, you Jeff, build, we go on? yep yep uh, sort of the rendering that's shown in the previous slide. There's there's no dome or protective structure or. Uh, protection from the wind or other environmental factors. Yeah, so so how do we do that? Um, uh, I, mean, I don't want you to get into that, it's just, just, just. It's an important point, and, and the cost of the dome and the structure. Um, Mike, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think there's a few different um, options for, for covering it. I mean, um, you know, we can build uh, Enclosure basically on the uh, on the ring with uh, small enclosures around each of the the major uh, primary mirrors and um, uh, you know I, I think there's there's definitely options uh, that are more out of the uh, box like lowering the whole structure into the ground and having some ground based covers that just cover the ring. You've identified a, a very important concern because the structure that has to cover it is important and the wind forces on the mirrors are are also important. And so the need to have some kind of a, a wind fence or uh, wind wind protection is is probably also it's certainly something that we have to look at in more detail than we have. Thanks. Um, so the other thing that happens now when we build a telescope this way is that we can synthesize a beam like we do in in radio astronomy. Um, so on the upper left is a pupil pattern for one version of an elf, and the diffraction. A, a pattern for that is right underneath it on a log scale and it, and it just shows pretty much what you expect that there's there's a core um, which when it's perfectly phased uh, has a diffraction limit essentially of the full diameter of the of the elf structure and then a lot of structure because it's it's made out of separate sub apertures and it's not it's not closely packed but Something magic happens if you allow yourself now instead of phasing phasing the system exactly you you um, you you dial in a phase uh, from zero to two pi uh, to each of the sub apertures and the, the this this um, image shows on the left the grayscale shows a variation in the phase and the graph on the right shows how those phases were adjusted and underneath it it shows the new beam pattern so what what we can do is we can construct a dark spot and we have lots of degrees of freedom because we have n mirrors or 25 mirrors i think in this and and as those mirror phases are adjusted we can create uh, a beam that has has a hole in it um, and of course that hole can be moved around by adjusting the phases and the existence of an exoplanet in that hole um, is, is something that's a lot easier to find uh, by adjusting that diffraction pattern. So we can create, uh, we, can, we can personalize the diffraction pattern of the telescope using basically the same, the same features in its construction, which is, which is that it is a, a, basically a radio telescope in, in the way that we adjust phases. That has yet another advantage, which is that, um, so one of the big noise sources in, 
in current choreography is phase noise is, is our is our ability to is is how the phase errors in the pupil plane map into the image plane, and um, it is. Uh, it's a great advantage to build a telescope that has a diffraction pattern um, that has that has a hole in it uh, where you want to look for a weak signal. And this plot looks like the previous plot, but what it is is a is a picture of the phase noise in the image plane, or or the intensity noise created by the phase noise in the image plane. And um, there's a there's an effect called speckle pinning or forgotten the name in the astronomical literature but in effect the the, the intensity noise is, is essentially modulated by the diffraction pattern and since we have a hole in the diffraction pattern this is the right telescope to look for faint signals um, in that dark hole and so there's a, a, a natural advantage when you build a telescope that has a diffraction pattern um, that has a, a, a big knoll where you want to find a faint signal um, so here's some images that show some of the work that's been done with window glass. Um, right now, the INSEC group in Lyon uh, with Gil is in the process of trying to build a, a mirror uh, with Tur polymer directly. Um, uh, the image on the lower right is pretty interesting. It shows it shows for uh, one element of this actuator a 500 gram mass that can be moved up and down uh, with the actuator voltage. So there's there's apparently no problem now in actually shaping thin glass. We have the dynamic range. The image on the left shows measurements of a technique that the group has worked out for, um, call it deterministically slumping glass. You can you can use um, Without touching the glass surface, we can we can create a parabola or or an off-axis parabola with an RMS error of maybe 10 microns or so, which means that we can make that glass into the uh, off-axis parabolic shape and then correct that shape down to the optical surface requirements using this sort of additive technology of of tur polymer. Um, and finally. This is Kevin's movie that illustrates the kind of telescope that we, we think we could build uh, for something like $50 million um, and dedicate it to uh, looking at exoplanets uh, with sufficient aperture for doing uh, even direct imaging and, and rotational inversion on a, on a system like uh, Prox B. So those are all the slides. Um, I, I, I think that it'd be great to enlarge the discussion now, um, kind of along the lines of where James started. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Uh, the simulations are interesting. Uh, what sort of wavefront errors and what what power spectra of errors, spatial and temporal, did, did you include in that? So in the phase errors here, this was just a, a, a random phase error that was uh, consistent with photon noise for a star that was something like uh, like Prox B and a band pass that was, was broad. Um, there's a, as you know, there's a lot of detail that, that goes into that, that, that we want to do more work with. Maud was going to um, Maud. You've done some more simulations beyond this, I think, mm -hmm. and and I think there's a fair amount of work to do to to make more convincing and realistic simulations. This was just a uh, a random phase error on the pupil, consistent with the photon the photon noise, um, uh -huh. and and that was all. Yep. Yeah. Just to, to add something when you didn't maybe uh, well what the advantage of the of the float glass is that it's smoother as the compared to the regularly polished telescope and lighter but the smoother is a very big advantage because then the small scale that are not corrected by the adaptive optics tend to limit uh, from, uh, 
some flaw on your achievable contrast. So I think it's, it needs to be properly simulated with the right power law from this flawed glass. And this has still not has been done, but uh, it is a. Uh, uh, no, we know that it is much better than regular Polish glass. Yeah, I, that that's of course. So one of the crazy things that we're suggesting is that we make mirrors without ever grinding the glass. And of course, when you grind glass, you then have to you, you fracture the surface to shape it, and then and then you try to undo the damage that you do to the glass. To, to um, and of course, you never completely get back to the very smooth surface. Float glass, the kind of glass that's in your window, um, is is never abrasively ground. Um, we generate the surface by bringing the temperature of the glass up to not its melting point, but we decrease the Young's modulus uh, so that we can use gravity and basically air pressure to solve a different equation that has as its solution a parabola. And um, it's kind of like Roger's idea of spinning glass, but spinning glass to make a parabola means that it, it, uh, it actually has to be molten. And the surface of molten glass when it dries, um, when it congeals, it has to be polished and has to be rubbed. And um, we, we think that we can, we can do this without ever touching that surface in this process we have. It gives a surface which isn't exactly a parabola. Um, and in the case of a molten glass that's spun, that's where the polishing gets the exact surface. In our case, uh, we take, we take um, John Fabian's tur polymer and um, spray it on the back surface with, uh, uh, with electrodes that get sprayed on the back. And, and then we, we correct the wavefront using some integrated observations of a point source. Um, and we hope the shape is held for a while. Occasionally we go back and we reshape it, but basically it's a dynamic surface that um, um, has, its, has its shape uh, defined initially by the slumping process and finally by um, an, active, an active system. So uh, what, you know, the optics in, th in instruments like Sphere and GPI uh, have UV lithography, uh, I guess I should use the word polished, but UV lithography quality surface finishes with RMS errors measured in, in high frequency wave numbers of a few, a few nanometers. How, how smooth is this process? Well, so, so your, your window, the, it's probably in your office. Um, has has an has a so it, the, it's polished with a. Um, it's kind of a. I, I think often glass is drawn over a, a roller as it's essentially molten, and then there's a there's a spray of of uh, high temperature flame that that um, fixes that surface. The surface roughness is uh, uh, ab about a factor of five to ten better than the sort of um, abrasive uh, super polish that, that we, we sometimes get. Um, so a really, a really nicely polished uh, a mirror could have sort of an a, a RMS roughness and high, high spatial frequencies of say a nanometer. And we've measured on just, you go down to the hard, hardware store and get a piece of glass and it's at least a factor of three and for scattered light that goes as the square of the roughness so it's sort of an order of magnitude better um and and then the magic is to figure out how to put uh, the density of of a uh, tur polymer on the back to fix the 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 other errors of course the window glasses on scales of a few centimeters isn't very flat at all so can we have I to comment? say again can i comment on this yeah please Okay, there is work from uh, Olivier Lardier, Antoine Leberry, and uh, Luc Arnaud, the Observatoire de Provence, about 20 years ago. And they actually made uh, two meter uh, mirrors out of uh, window glass for the, what well, at the time was called the Bull Telescope, which is a spherical telescope that should have been used for interferometry when Antoine Leberry had this idea of building a 27 aperture 
interferometer out of uh, very cheap telescopes or inexpensive telescopes. And what they used was actually one centimeter thick uh, wind, of, uh, wind of glass. And we had a working prototype with uh, um, actuators, actually. With, they were just electrical motors. They were pushing on the glass, just pushing. And, uh, and that worked. You know, there was some RMS error that you could correct post, uh, you know, with, if you wanted with uh, higher order adaptive optics, but we managed to get the telescope out of that, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm sold on. I, I think we're all, uh, great ideas uh, come and go and come again, and I think that that's, you know, the difference is now the technologies for being able to essentially build a printed circuit on a macroscopic piece of glass are pretty good, right? So we can now build an array of, of leads and, and actuators on this that are themselves very low mass and with, with sufficient um, force properties and force sensor properties. To, to be able to take that prototype from Labores of 20 years ago and, and, and do even better. Um, I, I, I wasn't aware of that project. I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to read about it if there's some place where, where we could see it. Was it published? I think so, at least in SPAE. Some SPAE are proceeding. There should be something. I can make some, uh, some inquiries to, and, and find out. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, yeah. I, I I think the difference now from from back then is that we we do know that there's a, a lot of work that's been done with with additive technology and 3D printing, and that's I think that's the secret that makes um, these mirrors now something pretty easily done. And and can I ask also, a, another question about the the simulations? Are those sure. Kronhofer propagation, or do this include? Uh, Fresnel propagation effects and chromatic effects. Um, so, so the chromatic effect is interesting. Um, so, the solution for the phases uh, on each of the sub apertures can be done over a range of wavelengths. So, this was a, a minimization problem that that I, I used to compute these, and um, we can imp improve the monochromatic to polychromatic properties. Um, by uh, just uh, minimizing over a range of wavelengths. And that's, that's what was done in this case, right? At, at a single wavelength, we can make a very, very deep hole um, uh, by minimizing over a range of wavelengths. The hole isn't quite as deep, um, but, it has, but it has good um, polychromatic properties. This, this was all, uh, this was not for now, no. Um, but, but it should be, and, and I think, I think there's a lot of room to to do a better job and a more realistic job in the simulations. It's expensive, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I and I don't. I, there must be some good software tools for for, for doing that, but I, I don't know about them. What, what wavelengths are you considering, and uh, what uh, resolution and bandpass needed for the uh, simulation that you did? Um, like showing the how you recovered from the light curves uh, map of the planet. Okay, so those are good questions. Uh, Svetlana did uh, all of these calculations. Why don't, why don't you comment on it, Sven? Yeah. So here, this inversion um, basically lethal inversions to get the signal to noise two hundred actually it works with one hundred as well, reasonably well. Uh, I mean, we tried twenty with twenty signal to noise twenty. You see over overall shape of continents, but not so much subcontinent details. Uh, so that range between twenty and two hundred uh, uh, would be fine uh, to start with and see what we can achieve, but. Um, when we say to achieve that, sure, we have to resolve planet from a star and we have to reduce the uh, contrast uh, the, of the scattered light from a star so to, to get its signal to noise. So first thing is to resolve planet from the star, collect as many, point, uh, as, as many possible photons. And then uh, once you have this light curve, you apply basically pretty standard inversion technique. I use that one for imaging of star spots on on um, on stars so that was uh, doppler imaging uh, and light curve imaging 
in my past and basically the same code to just change the geometry of the system. And um, assumptions here are just uh, as much physics as we can put in, uh, like scattering on in the atmosphere. Here there's a cloudless example given. So if there are no clouds, definitely it's much better what we can see from the surface or very thin atmosphere. But uh, scattering in the atmosphere and um, uh, clouds are also included in other simulations. And um, uh, basically it's independent um, uh, reconstruction for each pixel on the surface of a planet. Um, and this is the albedo uh, reconstruction, geometrical albedo reconstruction. Then um, interesting thing is that we can do that in different wavelengths uh, in broad passbands, as Jeff showed in the first graph, this, this standard uh, broadbands. Um, and that's already pretty good to uh, distinguish between um, desert areas and vegetation areas. So the spectra, low, very low resolution spectra photometry, you can call it, from the image, you can take uh, from each pixel on that image, you can get a spectrum and you can figure out basically what, what is made of. Is it the vegetation or rocks or ocean or, or ice? So that, that is kind of exciting that we can deal now not on, only with integrated um, over the whole planet spectra as we so far plan for telescopes we have, but now we can really deal with uh, resolved areas on the planetary surface and improve our detection of biosignatures. So, so this is basically a, a photometric experiment. Um, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this is all we can measure. I mean, it's photometric. Like, we can call it spectrophotometry. So we also discuss polarimetry uh, uh, to include that uh, with our experiences, uh, and that would help to get better constraints on clouds, of course, and on the surface composition. Yatlana. Yes? Could you also use line profile? Would you have enough signal to noise for that? Or would there be a use for that? Uh, uh, line profiles, spectral line profiles. Um, uh, yeah, um, I mean, we don't really count that we can resolve individual line profiles like we do on stars. So uh, that is, uh, the planet probably won't rotate so fast that we can apply really Doppler imaging here. And uh, we, you need an enormous amount of photons to resolve at these narrow wavelengths. So we really, uh, right now more realistically focus on spectral photometry instead of line profiles but, but there is within uh, the molecular uh, bands uh, i mean they are very broad if you have some idea of resolving molecular bands then then it's helping to detect the signatures definitely but um, for reconstructing the um, the top of the geography do you need the whole light curve over the period of the planet? Well, this is the best case, yes, if you have it, but we also did um, uh, seasonal inversion. So on Earth also we have seasons, so we've taken say 12 months uh, images of albedo of Earth, realistic uh, measurements, and uh, bury them. And I did three months inversions, and they they show less detail than, than we see here, but it's still very informative. We still see continents, and some details are not. Well, I'm now editing the... Say again? Uh, if there are some variable uh, effects like clouds, uh, this uh, won't disrupt uh, your light curve. Yes, they they definitely uh, disrupt. I mean, they sm smear out the signal. What happens with clouds? That amplitude, what you see in light curve, it reduces. So because clouds are smear the signal, um, and so the, you have small amplitude variations, and that's why contrast of features you recover is smaller, definitely. But um, the idea again that if you have a dedicated telescope looking at the same planet for months or maybe a couple of years even you can filter out uh, uh, clouds because the continent features will be stationary and clouds variable but but i think right the point of of uh, what this group is trying to do is to is to raise interest in a dedicated exoplanet telescope that that's capable of direct imaging and there are lots of right uh, your question about using using uh, high, high resolution noiseless 
to spectroscopy, for example, in a time-resolved way. The time, the time dimension you'll buy when you have a telescope that's dedicated to this and with the sort of area that we're talking about and any of the techniques that you use coupled with time resolution are, 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 are really mind blowing. Um, it was, it was a really interesting revelation. I mean, we talk about, um, you know, thermal emission imaging. And of course the problem there is that you don't have any, you don't have any latitudinal information, but if you take a planet in reflected light, uh, over the course of rotational and orbital time scales, you can reproduce latitude and longitude in ways that you, you might not have thought you could do. Couple that with any of the techniques that you use. Um, uh, polarimetry, for example, um, adding the dimension of, of looking at the, at the polarization of the reflected light as a function of, of, of time and, and wavelength has, has enormous amounts of information. So what I think we're trying to do is, is argue that the the ELTs are great, but they're never going to do the kind of problems that we we, we could do for exoplanets um, if we had if we had a facility and an instrument that was was um, that had these kind of capabilities. And and I mean, the other the, the the other part of our story is I think that if we're going to detect light light if we're going to detect life, um, we need this. And we've we've done some some calculations to just take a civilization that's maybe Earth-like and look at the heat that they produce and the geographic distribution of the heat. And that's a great biomarker. Um, and it's the kind of, it's the kind of signal that, that is eminently detectable from, from an elf-like telescope. Um, and well, so, yeah, I would like to add also, but an interesting feature also we will have in paper that um, like International Space Station have this great uh, solar panels and when you look from the space it's projected on a, on a uh, Earth image and if that Earth uh, is cloudy, cloudy then that contrast is so high that large panels like this in near space would be also detectable. So, I th and what, what we're working up to is, I mean, there, there are a whole bunch of interesting questions in here. One is that this, this can't be competitive or can't be seen as, as taking away from um, TMT or ELT or GMT. And I don't think it does. We, we, have, we have been working with, with private foundations and private um, support for all the work that's been done to, to date. And I think um, as you may know, all of the world's largest telescopes uh, through, throughout most of history were, were privately funded, not, not so much governmental. Um, but uh, the, the big deal is that there's, there's a lot that could be done if we had a, a telescope that was really designed for, uh, for exoplanet studies. And I think we're, we're looking to you as representatives of that community um, to get involved if you're interested and, and help help um, design whatever uh, coming out this group is going to is going to is going to engage in in the next few months. Um, it's clear, I think, from a lot of the questions that you've asked that there's lots of work to be done in in making more realistic calculations and um, maybe even understanding in a better way what what could be done with, with something like this. Um, so. Chef, can I ask a, few, a quick question? Yeah. There's a, this is Andrew Norton. Hey. Um, is, the, is the five meter diameter for the sub apertures fixed? Have you considered different different diameters and trade off with more at sub apertures? So part of, that, part of that comes down to how big can you make a piece of glass? Yeah. Um, and that's defined by architectural glass standards. Uh, we think that we could make, so if you're going to build a telescope, say the Colossus, which was a, basically a 100 meter scale optical system, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd, you'd make the glass on the site and, and because it's, it's relatively cheap and you would uh, also do the slumping and the shaping there and you could probably get up to 8 meters. Um, oh, okay. Uh, five, 5 meters turns out to be, from some of the glass people we talked to, talk to um, a kind of a, a standard uh, relatively easy not too challenging okay, okay. yeah yeah and, and then, the, sorry the, the gantry and the, the bits that go into um squirting the the turf polymer and the, the electrodes onto it turn out to be those are all easily doable at that scale but but i don't think that there's a 
I mean, on the other end, on the, on the small size, at what point does it become um, more economic to take a piece of glass and grind it? And, and I think that, that that's a pretty small scale, that this is, a, this is a way to make mirrors down to probably even half a meter. And we've been looking at, at, at the, you know, the trade-offs for the, the electronics and the, and the bits of the glass that are... Um, okay, okay. And then for the for the AO systems, are you uh, assuming that you'll probably use a, a dedicated wafer sensor for each five meter sub aperture? Yeah. So um, so these would be adaptive secondaries, right? And they're right. concave and they're elliptical. Um, and then in the in the optics to the system, you'd you'd have uh, and this is this is where we need lots of help with design. Mod Mod has started thinking about this in more detail. Okay. Mod, you, I don't know. Do you want to talk about what AO looks like for this? Um, yeah, like much like so. <clears throat> well, the wavefront sensor we we have in, been investigating new ways of of doing the wavefront sensing, but it's basically a like parallelized uh, adaptive optics, so where each. Uh, a large mirror gets a secondary that uh, does the correction for each of the of these sure. five mirror, and then yeah, you you have to do the wavefront sensing and also talk to the the co-phasing thing to to get it right. So the full control still is not uh, uh, fully developed, but uh, we have uh, yeah ideas on on how to deal with this. Are they are those ideas? Can I read more about them? Can I learn more about them somewhere? Uh, well, at least in Lyon, I think it, it's not frozen, so any new <laughs> idea and, and test uh, could, could be welcome. So we're looking at more interferometric uh, way of uh, uh, measuring the wavefront using a Maxander uh, wavefront sensor, which is more robust for uh, wh when you have uh, discontinuities like li large spiders or these things, even on a elt like telescope. But this is uh, very well suited and, and very accurate with low... Uh, Noise propagation since it's measuring the phase, which is the sign of the of the phase, rather than you have to, to reverse the, the problem. So noise, noise propagation, very small scale, spatial scale, high accuracy, uh, but then yeah, all parallelized for each uh, uh, five meter diameter mirrors. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jeff. So Andy, I, the the bottom line is yes, we'd love your help. <laughs> okay. Well, don't don't speak too soon, but okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, maybe I can make some comments. I, I have to go, unfortunately, in 10 minutes, but maybe I can make some comments Please. before I leave. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, uh, as far as the uh, atmospheric biosignatures, um, I, I'm a little bit of the literature, a paper that stands out with me is a, a guy in, in our group at DLR, Philippe from Paris, um, he did like a study of like, he, he assumed like a, an instrument capability similar to the terrestrial planet finder and did like a, like a retrieval, a spectral retrieval. And like when, when you like invert from the spectra into like what, what you can find out about the atmosphere or about like atmospheric biosignatures like oxygen and ozone. Um, and he assumed stuff like, like a signal to noise of one and like a, a wavelength resolution of 100 or 10. And one of the things that came out of his study was, was that it was actually quite difficult. If you put the Earth at 10 parsecs and, and you look for like the Earth's oxygen signal or you look for the Earth's ozone layer, then you, you won't really find it because the degeneracies like, like band overlaps and other effects mean that you won't be able to pin it down to better than a factor of 10. And I think it'd be interesting to do a similar kind of study with um, an instrument with, with like 100 meter um, capabilities. I, I guess nobody's done that so far. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, I, I have too, too many comments, I guess. I don't want to bombard you with information. No, but please. I was at the, um, the NASA workshop without walls um, in Seattle last summer. And one of the things that is beginning to be realized in terms of biosignatures in general, but also in terms of uh, atmospheric biosignatures is that you can you can just how much you can really do with if you have like a time dependence with the type of information that, that an instrument like this will be able to measure and um like in the biosignatures game it's like if, if, you, if you think you understand the photochemistry and the climate and you still can't explain it then then maybe it's due to life that what what you can't explain and if, if it, I mean, like photochemical signals of like ozone and oxygen and other species in the atmosphere, they have pretty well known time dependent relationships, which like, so some, like you see a signal in the Northern hemisphere, 
which is like reproduced like like six months later in the case of the Earth in the southern hemisphere. Um, or if you see a signal where you think you understand the photochemistry, but you see something else which you really don't expect from like a summer hemisphere or a winter hemisphere, then that's maybe also something interesting which you can discuss about. Um, so those yeah. are my thoughts, um, but I yeah. um, need to think about them a little, a little bit more, I guess. Well, I, I think we didn't want this to go on for too long, and the point was to just introduce some ideas and hope that, that most of you, or many of you, or some of you, could participate in a one-day meeting at the SETI Institute, which is, of course, deeply involved in, in all of these questions. Um, we, what we're planning is uh, just one day um, and uh, a chance for people to just to get together and talk about, well, I don't believe that, and, but yeah, maybe that works. We, we need to do some more modeling, and yeah, the AO is complicated, more complicated than we're, we're letting on to. All of those are, are questions that, that we need we need um, it's just a handful of people that are working on it right now, and and I think as we put this to paper, I mean you you've asked several questions. Can you read about it? Well, there's some SPIE um, uh, articles that that are are very broad brush um, descriptions, and and the expectation is that from this meeting we will have something which is not embarrassing, and and is is useful at the level of a calling card to various connections that many of us have uh, to individuals that can, can actually get us onto the mass shell, so to speak. Um, and, and we're, um, yeah, so we're looking forward to having um, a, a real discussion about many of the details and also a discussion about strategy within, within the communities that we represent uh, to try and, and engage folks. Um, so, uh, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to, and Svetlana and, and others are going to hang around to answer questions, but if you have to go, Lee and others, uh, um, my... Yeah, my, I just want to say thank you, Lee, for say, for mentioning all that, because we were, I myself was mostly focused on surface features, and your contribution would be great on, on that direction, on retrieval atmospheric signatures, and calculating actually what is uh, can what one can get with this telescope on atmospheric retrievals and i'm sure there is something which is exciting and uh, we, we can do something which is not possible now with other so, telescopes. so we have several jobs we have we have the job of getting people excited about what can be done for learning about life on other planets with something like this we have the job of getting people excited and and somewhat believing in this way of of doing the technology and getting more involvement with others that are much better experts than 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 me or, and, and others at some level in this involvement. And and the third is to get uh, folks that are able to speak to the right places um, to begin to shake loose some of the resources to go to the next step of prototypes and and, um, and telescopes that can actually do things. And Prox B is kind of a godsend, right? I mean, it's building a telescope that that can start to look at at, um, at that system I think is eminently doable for a few tens of millions of dollars with the technologies we're doing here yeah so to this workshop workshop at SETI on December 1st we invite scientists engineers and also entrepreneurs who are actually just interested in the idea to detect life in the universe and may help to mm -hmm. raise the funding and so as, as we scientists and engineers work on how to make it in practice uh, from, from the technical point of view, <laughs> they, they can help us how to make it in practice from financial point of view. And uh, raising interest in, in the community definitely is one of the aspects of it. And any one of you who is really interested in that or with, got some ideas, it would be great to see you in that workshop. And if you continue uh, working with us, it would be great. The problem for Europeans flying uh, 10,000 kilometers to to come for a for a one day meeting is a bit uh, hard. Yeah. Also, find well. So this is the beginning, and we will have. Uh, if you can stay up at night, uh, we'll have we'll have a virtual connection that we hope you'll be there at. Is is that doable? Yeah, that would be yes. Yeah, yeah, we understand. 
that, that it's difficult to fly one day one day but if you interested then they'll participate virtually that's also great but I, I should say I think that we're, we're also planning to do a similar event over in um, Svetlana's neck of the woods so to speak so in Germany so that, yes that's, com <laughs> that's coming can I propose also maybe since a lot of us will go to the SPIE meeting in tech in Austin Maybe it would oh, be yeah. to meet there as well. That's a good idea, yes. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. great idea. We'll set it up. This will be uh, in summer, next summer or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, Lee. Okay, bye, Lee. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah that's a great idea. We can coordinate that, in indeed. Yeah, let's keep this in mind, yes. Can I also um, say something crazy? Sure. <laughs> okay. It's a good group of people. <laughs> talking about involving entrepreneurs, okay? And there is a guy who's got very crazy ideas in the US and is doing amazing things, Elon Musk. Why don't you try to invite him? You never know what can come out of that. I think Kevin can comment on that. Well, Jill is probably a personal friend of Jill's, right? Jill, you know Elon, don't you? I think she dropped. Yeah. Like, yeah, she, she might not be here. Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. Um, um, I don't have any real avenues to contact him, sure. but, um, you know, of course, of course, Even having him there would be the great. I think he mainly works in LA, so you know, I'm not and sure how, how that might work. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I, is, um, is Pete Klupar here? He's probably a personal, personal friend of Elon. Somebody from Breakthrough is there. What you're doing in your in your Delta Tau? That's a Even different conversation. Yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah, I don't need myself. So. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, well, I those are that's not a crazy idea, and and the cocktail discussion is going to have a, a cross section of individuals from the Silicon Valley, Singularity University, and other places that that um, we have uh, had conversations with over the over the last few months. So it will happen. I, I'm not sure if any of us has access to the likes of Elon Musk, but if, if he's on your Rolodex, please, uh, please let us know. <laughs> um, okay, uh, are, are there other uh, technical or non-technical questions anybody wants to chime in with? Anyone? Um, Okay, then uh, we've got your email. Uh, we, we know who you are. We know where you live. We will, um, you'll hear from us, and I hope we'll see you and you're interested and willing to um, join and contribute and be part of this, this uh, interesting, interesting group uh, in, a, in a few weeks, December. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Ciao. Thank you. Good Bye. to see you all. Bye. 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 Bye.